Title reigns in the UFC are a funny thing. It's not enough to just win and then everyone loves you. Fans can turn on a dime if the right challengers aren't chosen or the bouts don't go a certain way. Maybe they see the belt is undeserved or too soon, a fluke. There are some real landmines out there if you hold UFC gold. And just because you're one of the most popular fighters doesn't always mean your time with the belt is just as revered. So with that in mind, today we're going to take a look at 10 title runs that really grinded fans' gears and had plenty of people relishing in the eventual downfall of the fighter who held the strap. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and the UFC 264 hype train is is rolling, so come jump on board with Bet Online, the official partner to MMA On Point. Feeling confident about the fights? This Saturday night at UFC 264, you can play along with us during our live in-studio fight companion featuring UFC fighter Patty Pimblett and actor extraordinaire Blake Harrison using the code On Point to get a 50% sign-up bonus good for up to $1,000. More on that later, but for now, here are the 10 most hated UFC championship reigns. Number 10, Brock Lesnar. Nobody likes someone who's just instantly great at something. It's annoying. Sure, everyone knew Brock Lesnar was a bona fide wrestling star, both pro and amateur, but he's just gonna waltz into the octagon after a failed NFL attempt and beat everybody? What is he, just a white boy and jacked and I'm supposed to deal with it? I'm a white boy and I'm jacked. Deal with it. Two fights into his UFC career, three fights into his MMA career, Brock earned a title shot against Randy Couture, even though he lost his debut to Frank Mir. And while of course he was popular with many, there were plenty of fans that weren't happy this wrestler had taken over the sport. This contingent of fans that couldn't stand him gave little to his impressive win over Couture. He beat an old guy half his size almost, big deal. Mir will smash him in the rematch. Those same fans were chanting stand them up as Lesnar mercilessly beat Frank Mir's face into new shapes. They booed as he flipped off the crowd. They couldn't wait for Shane Carwin to destroy him and had no choice but to get pretty quiet after Brock's amazing comeback. But they came right back when he was TKO'd by Cain Velasquez and lost his title so they could finally say, Ha! See? He's not even good. Look at him breakdance. What a loser. You sucked, Brock Lesnar. None of the impressive things you did matter because you lost to Cain Velasquez, one of the greatest champions in heavyweight history. Yeah, some people really didn't like him. Number 9. Michael Bisping. You either die a hero or you live long enough for people to be annoyed by the fact that the division isn't progressing because of your title reign. Such was the case with the Count Michael Bisping, who shockingly took the middleweight title from Luke Rockhold as a last second replacement at UFC 199, a moment the vast majority of fans absolutely cherished. It was the culmination of a fantastic journey, and there were a lot of people that got some good old schadenfreude out of seeing Cool Hand Luke take such a devastating L. But the honeymoon would not last long. A month after the win, it was announced his first defense would be against divisional number 13, Dan Henderson, who was two and three in his last five bouts. Okay then. Bisping shrugged off the criticism by saying that the whole division would still be there for him to fight eight weeks later. Unfortunately, Mike wouldn't fight again for over a year, and it would be against a returning George St. Pierre who had never fought at middleweight. Even worse, the fight would be officially announced eight months before it actually took place, with Dana White seemingly changing his mind about it every other minute. Everyone was hoping the count would either fight the surging Yoel Romero or Robert Whitaker, but a knee injury would keep him sidelined, something that further bothered fans who accused him of simply waiting for his GSP payday. Whitaker and Romero would have an absolute absolute war for interim gold, and by this point fans were all but done with the Bisbean era. It would end in spectacular fashion though, to headline UFC 217 and gave us the return of GSP like a delicious aftertaste following a stiff drink. Number 8. Tito Ortiz it's pretty wild to see Tito Ortiz go from this revolutionary record-setting champion, the first real modern star in the United States, to being considered one of the most hated by the end of his reign. The cockiness and the attitude that in part won him his popularity, sort of a real-life pro wrestling anti-hero like Stone Cold Steve Austin, would in time be perceived more as arrogance and jackassery. The real downfall of his title run's popularity, though, was Chuck Liddell. By 2002, the Iceman was rapidly becoming a fan favorite, with the mohawk and the knockouts and looking like a guy you might want to have a beer with at the pub, and 10 straight victories. Seeing Ortiz and Liddell finally clash, it's all MMA fans really wanted. But then Tito skirted the fight. In fact, he wouldn't see the cage for almost a whole year. And in an attempt to force him to fight Chuck, the UFC made an interim title. Unfortunately for Iceman fans, Randy Couture would win the bout, further delaying what they truly wanted. Something they were denied mainly because Ortiz refused it. When Randy literally and figuratively spanked Tito, fans were excited to see a little karma head his way. And the shift had happened. He would become a villain in the sport in the years to come, again in large part due to Liddell and of course Dana White. But the roots of it all took hold in that late era of his light heavy Anyway, title run. Number 7. Daniel Cormier John Jones left a real mess in his wake after a hit and run on a pregnant woman in 2015, and I'm not talking about what was in his rental car. His eight light heavyweight title defenses meant JBJ was the man, and he just defeated the biggest perceived threat to his reign in Daniel Cormier at UFC 182. But the hit and run would see the champ stripped and suspended right before a highly anticipated defense against Rumble Johnson at UFC 187. In his place would be Cormier, who would win, the now new undisputed champion who never beat the old one. Fans were happy for DC, but there was a contingent that felt as if the belt was just pretend. He would next defeat Alexander 
Alexander Gustafsson in an instant classic, but the shadow of JBJ still loomed large over his title reign, with many fans anticipating the UFC 200 rematch to finally set things right. When Jones fucked up again and that fight was cancelled, Cormier instead fought Anderson Silva in a non-title bout, where he was booed out of the building for holding the legend down all fight. When a second bout with Rumble played out in similar fashion, yeah, a good chunk of fans were sick of DC, but it wouldn't be for long. After getting done dirty by Jones yet again, courtesy of a head kick fueled by Terenabal, Cormier stepped back up as champion, and that's when things started to turn. Between his fight with Vulcan Ozdemir, his enjoyable commentary, and then his amazing double champ run, the DC fans called illegitimate was but a distant memory. Number 6. Conor McGregor it's not a controversial statement to say that Conor McGregor is the most popular fighter of all time, and it wouldn't be controversial to say he's one of the most hated as well. There are plenty of reasons that fans give for disliking the notorious one. His out-of-the-cage behavior, his hardcore fan base, his brash persona, and some of the things he says as a result of it. Stomp on his head as he's unconscious. The constant coverage of anything related to him, the perception that he's treated differently than the rest of the roster, which is pretty hard to deny. But where his championship reigns really rubbed people the wrong way is in the fact that he simply never did anything with his titles. His featherweight strap, not as much as the lightweight. Yes, it was 350 days before he was stripped of that title, two weeks after he won the lightweight championship, but it didn't feel like the division was being held up. He was the man at featherweight, and he was the man at lightweight, at least when he snatched the title from Eddie Alvarez at UFC 205. Then 511 days passed. Yeah, this is where things got bad. Connor went and fought Floyd Mayweather in a boxing match. Meanwhile, a pair of absolute killers are running through the division with no undisputed goal to fight for. He had log jammed lightweight and people had had enough of it. The murdering of a bus only compounded things and pissed off more fans. It was like, okay, cool story, bro, but when are you going to get in the cage and actually do something? That something would come nearly two years after his last fight, with some fans scoffing at him showing up at the press conference for UFC 229, holding two stripped titles. Number 5. Ronda Rousey Hardcore fans were so hyped for Ronda Rousey in the UFC, and as the first female fighter, she had massive mainstream appeal as well. She awed audiences the world over with her UFC 157 performance. Everybody loved her, but that would not last long, especially not after her season of The Ultimate Fighter. Rousey's contentious relationship with Misha Tate didn't paint Ronda in the best light. She came off mean, and usually unnecessarily so. That perception was only compounded by her refusal to shake Tate's hand after a hard-fought bout. From there, Ronda would go on her amazing run of first-round defenses, but along the way, the overexposure to Rousey and her hype became a real crisis for the champ. The UFC marketing machine, as well as the mainstream sports media, were shoving Ronda down everyone's throats. Joe Rogan was crying during interviews with her and saying, You're just a, a, a true once-in-a-lifetime human being. Think pieces were being written about whether or not Rousey could beat Floyd Mayweather in a fight. She was on TV, in movies, magazines. It was Ronda mania. The fan base was exhausted by it. And with her constant exposure, she was given more and more opportunities to put her foot in her mouth on a variety of MMA and non-MMA related topics. Then came the home fight. Sweet innocent, lovable Holly Holm, the literal preacher's daughter. Rousey famously called her a fake humility bitch. Holm was the perfect foil, and when she head kicked her into another dimension, the sports world collectively lost their minds. A lot of pent-up vitriol came spewing out from the most ridiculous places online. Fucking Lady Gaga and Donald Trump were chiming in on it. Ronda's reaction to her reign ending and subsequent self-exile, which in many cases would have drawn sympathy, mostly especially from the hardcore fan base, was met with apathy. Many didn't even want her to return, and when she did, they were more than happy to see her lose again. I think there's an alternate universe where Rousey remained popular. No tough, the hype machine laid off the hyperbole, her fighting spoke for itself. But that universe most certainly is not ours. Number 4. Jermaine Durandamy has nobody learned their lesson? You don't do bad things to Holly Holm. How can a reign be so short and yet so hated? In just 128 days, Jermaine Durandamy went from fans really not having too much to say about her either way, but generally seeing her in a positive light, to being called one of the most disgraceful champions the sport has ever seen. Damn, that's hard to do. It was the perfect storm, really, though. Durandamy fought for the inaugural women's featherweight title at UFC 208, an honor she would share with fan favorite Holly Holm. Now, beating Holm in and of itself isn't going to make you a villain, but cheating her out of the title, that is simply a bridge too far. Mr. Bird. I insist that we cheat. GDR would twice hit the preacher's daughter after the horn, the instance following round two staggering the former bantamweight champ. To the dismay of everyone, the referee only gave a pair of sternly worded warnings, but did not take any points. Points that would have either made the bout a draw or pushed home over the edge to get the win, something the majority of media outlets thought she had earned anyway despite the decision going to Durandamy. It was a bad time all around, and fans were just not having it. Her perceived villainy on that night would be compounded that next May when GDR announced that she was moving back to bantamweight and had rejected a fight with the division's true ruler, Chris Cyborg, over her past PED usage. PED usage from five years earlier. And so Durandamy was stripped, her entire time as champion, and how her reign ended, just pissing people off all around. Number 3. Tyron Woodley 
When champion Robbie Lawler got KO'd by Tyron Woodley two minutes into their welterweight title fight at UFC 201, fans were shocked, amazed, and upset. Lawler was beloved and coming off back-to-back -back all-time classic title defenses. T. Wood had narrowly beaten Kelvin Gastelum at a catchweight and then sat out for a year and a half saying he deserved a title fight. At least that was the perception of many. Immediately following his win, Woodley let it be known he wanted Conor McGregor, he wanted GSP, Nick Diaz, he wanted a money fight. Some fans perceived that as Tyron ducking the division's number one, Stephen Thompson whom he would eventually fight at UFC 205. He was booed mercilessly at the press conference for that event, and even though the pair put on a banger, it didn't sway many fans. His next two defenses being some of the most boring the division had ever seen definitely didn't help. Woodley was accused of playing it too safe. The champ regularly fired back at critics and was unafraid to take on the UFC, saying in interviews he was the worst treated champion in the history of the promotion, and that black champions like himself and John Jones were not being properly promoted. The soundbite headline response from Dana White was that Woodley was a drama queen, something that fans who disliked him latched on to. And even after an awesome performance against Darren Till, so many just couldn't get on board. He was by this point perceived as great, just not well liked. He would lose the title to Kamara Usman in his fifth defense. Ironically, all those fans who hated him will call him an MMA god if he knocks out Jake Paul later this year. Number two, Tim Sylvia. I've recently learned a lot more about Tim Sylvia, and I gotta say, I do feel just a bit bad for the guy. He showed up at Militich one day, Matt Hughes and Jens Pulver immediately gave him shit, nobody wanted him there, he literally cried after every practice, it had to have sucked. But he kept on going, and he kept on trying, and son of a bitch, he became a two-time UFC heavyweight champion. But man, people really didn't like it. They weren't into it at all. His first reign would span just a single defense, a boring bout after which he would be stripped because he failed a post-fight drug test. His second run as champion would start with a stunner when he upset the super popular Andre Arlovsky in their rematch, a TKO in the first three minutes after he was destroyed in their initial encounter. The trilogy came next and was one of the worst UFC title fights ever up to that point. His defense against Jeff Munson also a big whiff in the entertainment department. Sylvia was just not that exciting in the cage, and fans resented the fact he could jab someone to a UD from 70 feet away. Hardcores didn't think he could shine Fedor's shoes in that era either, which didn't help his popularity as champ. Fans were overjoyed when Randy Couture finally took the title from the big man, and his career would take some very difficult turns after that. Damn, what a heart warming entry this was. Go say something nice to Tim Sylvia if you see him today. Number one, John Jones. How do I even fit all this into a single entry? John Jones is simultaneously the greatest fighter of all time and the most reviled champion the sport has ever seen. Things started off great though. Jones was this plucky young champ, the youngest ever in fact, when he took the title from Shogun Hua, even stopping a damn robbery before he headed to the arena. Some fans weren't too happy about his strategy against Rampage Jackson, but they got over it. He had a great win over Lyoto Machida, beat his former teammate and rival Rashad Evans, but then the mask started to slip. His goody two-shoes role model narc on your friends who smoke weed persona that many felt was inauthentic took a hit when JBJ suffered a DUI a month after his fight with Evans. Then shortly thereafter came UFC 151, which was canceled when Jones refused to fight Chael Sonnen on short notice to save the card after his original opponent Dan Henderson pulled out. Dana White threw JBJ under the bus for that one, and between him and the ultra-popular Sonnen's campaign against the champ, 205's king was now someone you loved to hate. Fans lost it when Vitor Belfort sunk in that armbar. They were so mad when Alexander Gustafsson didn't get the judge's nod. By the time he'd defeated Glover Teixeira, Jones was getting constantly memed over his eye-poking something he mocked in an Instagram post he would of course delete. <laughs> Jones put his finger in his eye, the dirtiest fighter in MMA. <laughs> his social media presence often fueling more of the fire against him. Then came all the suspensions and the three times his title would be stripped, the hit and run, the drug fails, UFC 232 getting moved because of some pulsing picograms. Interestingly though, his fan base grew through all of this as he was seen as a sort of anti-hero figure, especially as he clashed with the UFC from time to time. But don't get me wrong, there were still a ton of fans simply tired of his shit. Jones remains polarizing still, his narrow wins and his last Last two fights providing fodder for those who hate him. He's also being criticized for how long he's taking to go to heavyweight. But at this point, fans are going to hate him for anything and love him for anything as well. Except for drug test failures, I think we've all seen enough of those. Thanks again to our official partners, Bet Online. Make sure to come join us for our live UFC 264 in studio fight companion this Saturday, featuring UFC fighter Patty Pimblett and actor extraordinaire Blake Harrison. You can play along with us at betonline.ag using the code on point to get a 50% sign up bonus good for up to a thousand dollars. See you at the violence fight fans. A big old shout out to my dude Luke Taylor for editing this video together. You can find him and his awesome digital art on Twitter at cool to me underscore. A big, big thank you to Ben Rosette who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page at Ben Rosette. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.